Hello, everyone. Welcome to the DFJ online meetup. Um, so if you haven't joined us before, we'll do a little bit of logistics first, and then I'll, uh, I'll introduce our speaker, and we'll get underway. So if you, so on your YouTube window, so there'll be some code in this talk, and you probably want to be at a 720p resolution or higher, which you can control from the bottom right-hand side. Uh, if you like the talk, so don't forget to like it on YouTube so that more people will watch it uh, afterwards. And yeah, I guess that's all my all, all the all the logistics will go for about 45, 50 minutes or, or so. Uh, so our speaker today is uh, Norbert Prying. Hopefully I, I pronounced that right. So I came across uh, a piece of work Norbert has been doing, analyzing Debian uh, packages probably a couple of months ago. And so, uh, so Norbert's going to talk to us about that today. So I guess I'll, I'll hand over to you and I'll let you introduce yourself and then uh, we can go on with the, with the talk. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining, um, especially for those in the United States. It's very early, but here in Japan, it's already quite late. I'm actually starving for a beer, um, but well, afterwards. OK, yeah, so today's topic is about Debian packages. And yeah, I will, yeah, I just jump straight into my slides so that you, yes, here. So, um, analyzing Debian packages with Neo4j. Um, yeah, I want to start with a bit of a self-introduction. So, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not a computer scientist. I'm a logician by education with about 20 years in research in theoretical computer science. I've been working in, well, it, well, several countries, Austria, Italy, uh, and now since several years in Japan. Since about a year, I'm working now for a Japanese company in Tokyo, Axelia Incorporated, so Axelia Kabushiki Kaisha in Japanese. It's a CDN, content delivery network, IT service, and yeah, my job is mainly on, well, research development, security, and machine learning. Besides this, I'm, well, Debian developer since about, well, I don't remember actually, 20 years, mainly related to tech. I don't know how many of you have heard about tech. I mean, this is a strange uh, tech, probably is more common, the pronunciation, a strange typesetting program. And I'm also a developer of the Tech Life, um, main author of the Tech Life Manager. So for those who have ever used it, Tech Life, they probably have used some of my code. And uh, by the way, I'm also a complete beginner with graph databases. So um, what I present you now is like my first steps with it. So why did I choose to discuss about graph databases or use graph databases? Well, one thing was that within our company, we were preparing some, well, recommender system for potential clients. And the natural way to deal with this for us was that, uh, well, using a graph database was a graph was the natural way to represent the available data. So for me, it was somehow necessary to start um, while well, working on the data and learning a bit about graph database. The other thing is that, um, well, from what I read and checked a bit of the internet and examples, most of these data are was about a highly, I mean, was, was very hierarchical data, so a nice structure, you know. While the, what I wanted to see what happens if you have very highly non hierarchical data in a graph database, so a lot of yeah, quite interconnected structure. And then um, a colleague of mine was also playing around with that and trying to get a feeling for how it works. And um, we were trying to get a reasonable sized, not too small, but a reasonable sized uh, test data or uh, data. And uh, for me, it was important to have a reasonable sized, but also meaningful data. My colleague just, well, generated random data and a random graph that is interesting, but it doesn't help you for search for answers. So um, that was the reason. And well, last but not least, uh, graph databases are nowadays hip, like all the uh, NO SQL databases. Um, what I want to talk about is a lot of stuff. I'm, I don't know how many of you have heard, well, use are using or are very familiar with Debian. So I will give a quick introduction to Debian. Um, so more or less what is necessary to understand what's going on. Then what what are packages in Debian? So how is the life cycle and how they are built? And then I introduced the, the UDD, Ultim, Ulti, Ultimate Debian Database, which is uh, a huge database um, while well, connecting a lot of things. 
The main part will be discussing how to represent parts of this UDT. I mean, the parts I've done by now, the packages uh, in the in a, as a graph. So, so to say, the database schema. Uh, a bit about conversion from the UDT to Neo4j, a few sample queries and some concluding remarks. So let's jump into it. So Debian, what is it? It's an open source Linux distribution developed mostly by volunteers with, well, quite a lot of offsprings. I mean, most famous probably is Ubuntu. It has strict licensing requ requirements. At the moment, I don't know if the numbers are correct. Actually, I know the numbers because they are, they'll come later on, but the, the first numbers are probably wrong. So like about 30,000 source packages building about 80,000 binary packages. And well, yes. So what's interesting is that a Debian releases. So it's not we the Debian has rolling releases like many other distributions of Linux. So you just upload a new package, it's compiled, and it's immediately available to the user of the standard. No, this is like we have preparation and there's a stable release, and that is well released about every two years. Also, they want to shorten the release cycle. Uh, this is of, so officially released with security support and 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 updates, so point releases. And there are not big changes in a stable release. So before we have a stable release, there's a testing release. This is, so to say, the preparation for the next stable. There are packages that, that have seen quite some testing already. And so to say, there are thought about entering state so we are ready for the next stable release and then there's development or as id sit still in development this is the entrance point for all packages it's the main development point so packages first enter into there and then well transition into testing there are a few more other places like experimental this is when you upload something just which is not prime time ready or well, we often use, I often use it also during pre-release freeze that, well, just to get past FTP master or something because it takes too much time. Anyway, there are other releases. I, I don't go into details in point releases for stable. We have old stable just for hist and historic releases and all kind of stuff. Not that it matters here. So a bit about how it, it works. So here there's the experimental. This is something when you upload the package into the experimental, well, it just stays there. And well, most people don't use it anyway, but you can upload it. The main path through the table is, well, you just, there's a new upstream release or a bug fix or whatever. Well, then you upload into unstable. This is what where everything goes on. And then after, well, 10 or five days, well, nowadays it's five days, as long as there is no critical bug, so then this package transitions into testing and there it remains well until the next release is done. Well, and release is done by <coughs> a release manager and that is quite complicated. The, the target is to have no critical release bug, but that it never works out. So uh, at the end, at some point there's freezing and testing adjustment. And they release a stable new release and here only yeah, we can upload new patches. This is like security releases. This is something a Debian developer has to do now and then. But that is more or less the cycle. So your package enters here into unstable, then goes to testing and then to stable. So packages in Debian. Um, one thing is that since Debian is, well, open source, um, for everything that is distributed in Debian, there, are, there is source package, and then there are binary packages. The thing you actually install, but for every binary package, there has to be, well, some way to build it, and that these are the source packages. Developers usually upload a source package and together with a binary package or just source only. And all the other architectures are then built by auto builders, some server somewhere running and updating. And then, well, it's uploaded into unstable or rejected, whatever happens. So this is a bit the life cycle. So we upload a source package, maybe a binary. This is most of us here run on AMD64, upload it to the unstable well, and then the source package is sh shipped out to the auto builders and builds a lot of binary packages for architectures. And well, they go then into the release. Versions, versions in of packages in Debian are, well, they are quite complicated. So current versions in CDEBIN stable and security releases. So we have, 
if you go to 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 For example, this is the the package overview for for my own packages. So the the packages I maintain, and here normally we have for old stable the releases, the stable releases, testing. Most of them are in stable and testing the same, and in experimental. And then there's further data about Ubuntu or version system and whatever this. So these are the versions that the main versions that are in the released uh, parts. But there are also intermediate versions that never ended up in a, in one of the release. So because you upload and then you upload another bug fix and then you upstream and so on. So for example, if I did the asymptote package, a program for, for our technical drawings, then old stable, we have this version number 2.31-2. In stable, we have 2.38-2. And in testing in SIT, we have now 2.41-2. But there are many other versions if you have been uploaded that can be checked. So while well, there are some listed, but there are many more. But they never made it into a release. It's just that you see there are many more versions. So how do version numbers in Debian look like? So this is the standard format. First, you have separated by colon, but this is optional, an epoch. Then you have the upstream version. And then followed by the upstream version in the most cases, unless it's a Debian internal package, but most packages are not Debian internal, of course, the Debian revision. Because for the same upstream version, well, well, you change a bit in the packaging, you fix bugs or something, you increase the Debian revision. So for example, for asymptote 241.2, what does it mean? You have upstream version is 2.41, and it's the second Debian release. And for a bit more complicated package I maintain, this is music stack. Uh, this looks like a very strange version number. Epoch is one because I had to pump up the version number once. And then the upstream version is just, well, the version the, the upstream author uses, plus I attach some, well, whatever, it's like a date stamp, more or less. CTAN is a comprehensive dev arch network because upstream auto uploads often to CTAN without changing the version number. So, well, I have to get some new number. And Debian releases four. So these are the, the versions we have normally in, <coughs> in, in day life. So what is what makes up a package or what information is available. So the maintainer, this is the, the, the guy who is responsible for it. Um, it's not necessarily a person. It's in many cases, it's a mailing list or yeah, it's either a mailing list or a person. So for example, in my case, we are managing the tech packages in a certain, in a group tech maintainers. Well, most active, well, it's preferable probably mostly only me and very few others. But anyway, there's the list where all the bug reports go. And then the uploaders, these are actual persons, actual Debian developers who are allowed to upload packages. And then there are things like section priority. There are not so much interest as structuring a bit. The version number, then dependency declarations. We will come to this a bit later on. And while there are lots of further fields, but I, I don't want to overload you for now. So um, some caveats that are important. So you, you heard about there are now source package and binary package, but be careful. One source package first can build many different binary package. Actually, this is most of the time it's the case. Um, for example, if you have a huge package, well, a huge reasonable package that builds a library, a shared library package, but also the development header package. So these are two binary package. So one source package often builds different binary packages. And then there's one more thing, the names of the source and the binary package are not necessarily the same. Well, of course, well, if one source package builds several binary package, then of course they are not necessarily the same. But it's even worse that completely different packages, source packages can build uh, another binary package. We will see example later on where, well, I incorporated one package into the, another source package, and so the source package changed. Uh, this is what I mentioned here. Yeah, binary packages of the same name can be built from completely different source packages. So there is, it's very a loose uh, connection. It's really fixed only for a specific version, but but nothing more. Okay, dependencies. So there are 
a lot of dependencies and very complicated in Debian. So they are very, very complex. Yeah, it just, it just dropped off. I'm not sure what happened. Yeah. Okay. Go on. All right. Back to you again. Yeah, you've got the yeah. power. It's not presenting yet. I guess you need to share your screen again. Do I have to do something? Yeah, you need to share, present your screen ah, again. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. But I'm I'm online. Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, every, online sorry everyone for the chaotic. I'm somehow. It sounds like also we are in Japan. It doesn't mean that we are good connected. So I guess I lost you here. I hope uh, this is. Yeah, we were around here. Yes, around here. So, okay. So that was happened when. Uh, Debian uploads a source package, builds a binary package, uploads it to unstable, and then the, the auto builders build the other binaries. So I think versions, I re well, okay, repeat this. So we have current, whoops, uh, current versions that are in the releases, in the old stable, stable testing and SIT, and then security releases. And then there are intermediate versions that never ended up in a release. So for example, here, this is my, my, uh, Debian developer dashboard where the packages I maintain and well, they are the old stable, stable testing and unstable releases. And which one is the one? No. Yeah. And so, so uh, but they are intermediate. So in old stable, you had this version number in stable 2.382 and in testing in SIT, we have now 2.412. But there were many other versions in, well, that never made it into any release. So what is the version number? You have Epoch, Upstream, and Debian revision. I just skim over this because it's getting then late. So it's Upstream, Epoch is, well, just an emergency measure if you want to uh, overwrite version. Then you have the Upstream version and the Debian revision. For example, this package 241, Assumptured for graph for doing technical drawings, is Upstream 241, and we had two Debian releases, and then there's a bit more complicated with Epoch, an upstream version with a time tag and a Debian release. So what's in a package? These are maintainers. Who is responsible of my mailing list? The uploaders who is actually uploading the package. This is irrelevant. The version number we discussed before and dependency. Dependencies are very complicated and a lot of further. Just four things. This is important. Source and binary package might sound that they are very strictly connected, but they are not at all. So one source package can build a lot of binary packages, and the names of the source package don't need to agree. They don't ha need to have anything in common. They usually have something in common, but it's not necessary. And so, for example, binary packages of the same name can be built from completely different sources. Dependencies, so we are, Taibian has a very complicated system of dependencies. Let's start with the binary package. You want actually install, so the unusual dependencies and recommend suggest. So depends is an absolute requirement you need to run. This is a very strong recommendation on Debian automatically recommends are installed and these are weak recommends. And then there are some other for incompatible packages. And for building source packages, there is something similar. To express relation, it always looks like you give the name of the relation then a package name, so like depends on a package. But you can also give a version dependency. It's like breaks against the package less, less, so strictly less a version. You have alternative dependencies between package one and package two, and packages that are well restricted to architectures. So the UDD. This is this huge ultimate Debian database that collects a lot of stuff. It imports data from various sources like the package and source files of all of Debian and Ubuntu, bugs from Debian and from Ubuntu, and then, well, the full history of uploads and migrations, and, well, a lot of other things. Um, just, to um, just to give you an idea of the schema here, so th this is the schema da as, as PNG. You, you, you don't see a lot, right? But if I go to the SVG version, then, well, you see, it's an infinite list of tables. And I just pick up one or two here. Um, where is this? 
public sources. So these are the source packages where you have the source name, the package of the source, and the version and maintainer and lots of other fields. And many of these fields are duplicated in other areas. Like, for example, you have packages here. These are the binary package. We have, again, the package name, the version, and the maintainer, and architecture, and a lot of the, all these dependencies. So this is a highly denormalized uh, database, quite complicated. I mean, it's a typical example of grown over time. You know, it's like first only a small source, a bit, and then more and more sources are taken and included into this use relational database with a lot of duplication. And it's, of course, it's a pleasure for any SQL fetishist to, to write backend code that tries to make something out of this. There is a, there are actually quite a lot of uh, services, like for example, the maintainer dashboard based on the UDT that gives you like bugs and versions in a different layout and wow, all kind of security and Lintian warnings and what derivatives like Ubuntu are doing and this kind of stuff. So there are quite a lot of stuff. So the question is, can we put the UDT into a graph database? So that's somehow, that was my idea. I want to have a reasonable sized, big enough uh, data to put into this. So when when you try to convert this, I mean, the first thing is you start thinking about what are the entities? What are the nodes? What are the, the, the edges? What are the entities of the graph? And well, you look at what's happening and I concentrate on the packages for now. So source, a source builds a binary. So you have well, you have source and binaries, so we want to have different nodes, as I mentioned before. Um, there is not so strong, we have different nodes for source and binary and versioned one, so every node can have a version. And while well, we also link increasing versions that we have somehow a tree of versions. Then we have dependencies, these are the unversioned, because we have a lot of unversioned dependencies, we want to have also a different node type for the unversioned source and binary packages. So we have uh, unversioned, like the source package name, and then versioned uh, instances. So what does it mean? So for node and relations, for now we have a source package, SP, as a type, a version so source package as node type, a binary package, and version binary package. And the relations, like a version source package is an instance of a source package, same for a version binary package is an instance. A source package builds a binary package. And that's actually wrong. It's a version source package should build a version binary package. Sorry here, should be two Vs here. And then they are next, so the next bigger version. So this is something. So here is a good example. So here we have a source package actually two and here we have version source package i'm um, uh, it's not shown but this is so four di so, so different source package and this is the binary package and these are the binary package with version so version binary package so you see this is just an increasing this this is the oldest version in stable as in old stable in stable in testing and in uh, un well, i don't know unstable i guess and well, they are all instances of a binary package LuaSec. And you see here that the source package LuaSec builds this binary package, and this LuaSec builds this binary package. But at a certain case, it was switched at a tech life base, actually. A, a certain a different tech as uh, a source package builds LuaSec because it was incorporated here. And so the source package here and the version source package here, they are different. So we have a, well, a graph here. You have a nice next relation. This is the binary package people can install with next, next, next. But the source package are quite different. Next step, what we want to do is to register which binary package are actually included in a suit or in a release. So while well, you have a node type suit and then suit contains a uh, version binary package, well, that you see here, for example, this was in included in VZ, so VZ contains this, is the old stable, the, no, old, old stable, this is old, old stable, this is old stable, then stable contains LuaSec, and this is testing, and SIT both contain the latest version. 
So here, these are the releases. Of course, there are many more errors going out, but I show only the info. So these pack, these releases, so to say, contain or suits, as the, the name is. Then next is if we want to register the maintainers of binary and source package. So we have a node type maintainer. That maintainer maintains as a version binary and source package and, and so on. So here we have Debian Tech maintainer maintains these two. So here see first the Debian Science maintainers maintain these two, and then it switched to the Debian Tech maintainers who manage these two source package and well, these two binary package. So now we have here the source package. Of course, this you cannot decide which is uh, well that you could, but that this is, but it's not necessary that this is always maintained by the thing. So here we have maintainers, the version source package, what they build the binary package, uh, as a version binary package, binary package, and releases. So this is the structure we have now um, in this database. The worst or the com most complicated thing are tracking down dependencies. So the current state is, well, that I represent, so uh, that was complicated and we'll discuss this later on. Uh, the current state is the dependencies are represented as a relation between the version, so as a binary package, to the unversioned binary package. So this is, so to say, the target. If, oops, if, if some package depends on Lua sec, this is the target. So, for example, a different package like here depends on Lua sec. We'll see some examples. And here, this is pretty also the only place where I add uh, tags in the relation. So, so the depends relation has two tags. Actually, there should be, uh, that is disappeared in the tech code. So to it, they have two additional types, the relation type. You remember it's lesser equal, strictly equal, strict, lesser equal, equal, bigger equal. And the relation version, where version is non for unversioned, otherwise is one. So how does this look in the package? For example, I, I just deleted the upper part because it's getting too complicated. And here, for example, we see that this LuaSec source package build depend independence, this is the, the version, on, well, this tech life package and so on. And actually no package depends on LuaSec. I just go to... Here. So, here, for example, you might need to zoom in a little bit because you cut you up. Otherwise yeah, but this, I, I, the, 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 sorry, the, I don't know why, but Neo4G doesn't allow to zoom further in. Yeah, you can only do it with the browser with the command plus. That's about. Uh, that, but that doesn't actually. Zoom. Oh, it's doing the opposite. It, uh, it, it doesn't zoom in the, in the picture. <laughs> All right, leave it. Leave it then. So that's. I, I tried it actually. I hope that it, uh, that it gets a bit better. So well, it's hard to see here. So for example, here you have a relation. Hard to see. Depends. Relation type is bigger equivalent to a zero. So well, then let's leave this if it's hard to see. Uh, that's the reason I put everything in here as much as possible. Yeah, so I, I wonder whether like zooming the other way would actually make it bigger. That like if you zoom. Oh yeah, it does. Oh well, yeah. Well, but, but I, yeah, kind of. That's the, that's the max I can do now. And yeah, okay. Um, okay, now every, the, this, the written text is so small that you don't see it. So here, well, these are built. And here, these are all dependencies on build dependency. Um, I just uh, oops, oh, messed up the button. Uh, here it is again. OK, so there are no other dependencies on this. Uh, oh, there is. So example, here is to take, so this package here, science something suggests Lua sequence and I don't know what this is. I, now it's too small for me to read. And tech life something replaces Lua sec. So so you have a lot of connections from other version binary packages to this 
unversioned so as a binary package giving all these connections and in all these connections you have normally also a version number or well or normally there is no version number but often there is a version number okay so one thing I you remember that when I discussed here was it here we had so we have seen also how to deal with this relation type and this relation type well it's actually the same I treat this one here like with non type so how to deal with these alternative dependencies this is a bit tricky so what I chose was I uh, that I created a new node type I just tr think about every every concept I try to get every concept into its own node type so and the node type is called alternative dependency here and an additional relation that says is satisfied by so for example for this alternative dependency so some packages depend on either music stage in this version or tech live music well then this alternative dependency is either satisfied by one of these two packages where this is uh, again a relation like with version number and this so of course these here are they are sorted and everything so that that, that you don't have the application but in principle um yeah there are some of these these are alternative dependencies so let's go to summary of nodes and relations and and what we have now so at the moment what you have is nodes and attributes are maintainer the maintainer is a node type that has name and email as simple i mean there are, there is a slight problem because maintainers sometimes change the not the name but so the name of the mailing list or typos or representation but the email stays the same so i i, I merge this into one because it's actually one unit or something and then we have binary packages source packages suit and alternative dependencies they have just the name nothing else there is there is nothing more it's just the name and the version binary packages and versions as we have in addition to the name also the version and relation most of the relations between these packages build conflicts whatever satisfies whatever they have two attributes this is the relation type this is, means that less or equal, strictly less, uh, equal or something, and the relation version, so what is standing behind, whatever. And then there we have builds, contains, is instant of, maintains, next. They have no attributes. They just say, well, this is a member of somehow this suit or something. So this is the whole set of uh, nodes and relations that are currently um, carried, so that you give a bit of the numbers. So in the, the nodes, we have suits, you, you might uh, say it's a bit strange why there are 28 because there are so many security and point releases there is not only one stable but there are five stable releases point releases for security and so on maintainers we have at the moment about 3500 alternative dependencies well quite a lot actually well that's quite common source packages well it's not so bad what i mentioned in the beginning so a bit over 30,000 and binary package that was quite raw uh, wrong what I mentioned in the first is like 154,000 and version source package we have here and version binary package this is what actually appears in all of DBN in the last is like 250,000 about so in total like 500,000 know. and relations well blah, 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 I don't go through the numbers like 4.5 million around so this is what currently is in the database um, how did I do the conversion or well currently do the conversion so there is a public mirror so everyone listening here is invited to <coughs> to check this out so this is no problem that on the wiki page I linked before there is the username and password it's also in the github you see later where I committed the script it's a public mirror and while well, I use Perl and, and DBIPG to, to just pull the information from the tables I use. So it's the tables I showed you, the source and the package table, but nothing else. There is nothing more. Actually, what I did before, I used the, the command line, pgsql, and created the CSV file, but that was really hard to parse due to, well, internal new lines and this stuff. So, uh, well, it was much easier to do in this way. Okay, conversion to Neo4G. So my first try, I, I told you in the beginning, I'm a complete beginner. My first try was to generate a lot of cipher statements. 
well, that wasn't very good idea. I think for everyone that has tried it, I mean, if you have like something like a few million cipher statements, you can leave your computer running for ages and probably will not finish anyway. Yeah, so I, I, I did that as well. <laughs> <laughs> It was like, I mean, it's like, I because first you do some experiments and there it is just small data set and everything yeah. works. And then, then you just suddenly have this huge bunch and then it's like, why is after five hours nothing finished and next morning still yeah. not so well? Yeah, I think so, it's yes. because that's what you do in SQL, isn't it? I think that's what it Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It it's works like... pretty well in SQL. It does not work pretty well inside. <laughs> anyway. Yes. So I, I was I was surprised. Actually, I was surprised about the huge difference between. Well, but well, it's it's somehow understandable why. So I used the Neo4j import tool. I just with the recent release, actually, you should not use this anymore, but you should use the Neo4j admin tool with the import command. I haven't converted by now. Sorry. Um, so what I what you do in principle is you generate for each node in relation a CSV some ideas and run Neo4j. So actually that that was really surprising because what we cipher never ever finishes. Like today I run it, I regenerated everything today. That was like 10 seconds uh, for, well, this amount of relationships. So this is actually quite nice the timing. Yeah, the, the, I can explain the difference between the two. For right, it's people. obvious. It's it's obvious, of course, because you have the transaction security in the Java server, and yeah. but yeah, that, it, if you if you generate like complete cipher statements, it's doing all of that in one transaction only. So yeah. it creates like a, the transaction state for whatever five hundred thousand nodes. Yeah, it's probably like garbage collecting your whole computer over and over again. I imagine. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. And then the, the admin import <laughs> command. Pretty much the same as the Neo4j import tool. It, it's all, it's almost calling the same code. So, yeah, um, yes, yeah, just a new way of doing things. <laughs> well, well, it's just that what what I I haven't come around actually is that I mean because you have to for this for the CSV uh, for this import tool you have to generate UIDs some something unique for the nodes and for the relations and actually this is data that is not actually of important. Actually, this is something I want to get rid of in the database afterwards. So I guess there is somewhere and a way to delete all this UID data I have created. Anyway, so how did I generate this node? Well, so this is a Perl program. Uh, well, it's not actually the CSV files from PSQL. So, but I, I read the database and dump it into a Perl uh, array and dump it on file and then read this in again generate a huge hash with all the information it's well it's now when it runs it's like if like seven gigabyte or something of memory that's just occupying so not that bad the previous version actually used like 16 17 gigabyte and crashed my laptop a few times because when i do it on the main computer at home is no problem but when i do it on the laptop in my com in the company or something then suddenly i don't know why doesn't don't have my laptop more than 20, oh no, more than 16 gigabyte and everything comes to an heart. And then, yeah, for each item, I generate a unique UID. I mean, this is what I mentioned before, but this is, I mean, that you actually get everything right and then generate all the necessary CSV. And well, then you just call the, the import tool on the CSV. And as I said, then this is just like hell of fast. Um, a few sample queries you have seen a bit, for example, find all packages in Jesse that build depends on some version of Tech Common. So Tech Common is a package I maintain that provides some basic infrastructure for tech related packages. And I would be interested in well, which packages build depend on this. And well, well, you it's it's actually not that bad, surprisingly. Uh, yeah, now it's gone. Uh, hi, hi, hi. Go away. So here. And now it's big. Interesting. So that's uh, smaller, yeah. So this is a typical here's the chassis release. Here are a lot of binary packages that somehow depend on have a source package and 
build depend on tech common this is for me interesting so i mean most of the packages i maintain myself but there are quite a lot i don't maintain myself so if i'm if i mess up something in tech common then well for example this package here lip chigiti text quite an important package or something maxima they will they will come after me and will not be very happy so this is a, a typical stuff what i was also interested in is somehow is is which which package is so the, the well, most important in uh, most important you cannot say but most used package for building other packages so i want to see the number of packages in sit that build depend on x whatever x might be and ordered by the number of depending packages so this is a bit a, a bit longer scurry not so complicated but easy to read so we match against s is the suit contains a version binary package that is built by a version source package and that one build depends on x so x this is what we want we want to fix it onto the suit sit so in still in development and then we we pump all this into the next one where where x point name as package we continue as package and count the number of virtual source package version source pack source packages so how many source package actually use the this package x for building as counting and then return package and the number of counts ordered by minus count so that you get the 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 biggest one first uh, so that you would get here so this is uh, for example this is the the query here well, it actually co works quite nicely if i rerun it so you see that helper is used by well it's actually used by practically every package by 50,000 and but it was surprising for me that python seems to be very popular because it's already the second most used this is a helper package for packaging python programs it's the second most used i mean package config is for all kind of libraries so that is understandable that is very common and auto reconfig this comes so these are standard packages but python is really like one of the most used packages that was surprising for me okay yeah these are the numbers here somehow okay some conclusions um lessons learned i learned but for me everything was a lesson so the whole was a lot of fun um finding a good representation is quite tricky um my my aim was to to abstract as many concepts into different node types as possible because i mean having tags within the node type sounds a bit like cheating this is a bit too much like a relational database for me but anyway i come back to this because as i mentioned before with the relational depend as with the dependencies this is it's actually not as nice as i wanted to have well don't use cipher we discussed this already i mean you use cipher for short things but not for anything else then conversion of an old or grown relational database is a pain i mean actually this is not only this one here I'm, i also looked at a completely different this is uh uh rec space it's an open source program for managing like data center so like racks and the computers and uh, the servers in there and the docker containers or whatever and that would there's also a classical example for a da um, graph database but i mean converting this huge database is which is even worse than the udt was it just out of discussion i mean you have to it's it's very good for starting from scratch if you have a new application something new you develop for for a client so what i'm currently working on a recommendation system where new data and everything then it's absolutely nice working with old data and rewriting stuff uh, stuff was is quite challenging what i also realized um i'm not sure how far this is aware that the visualization is somehow tricky it depends on version and operating system which of chrome and firefox is doing better or is less uh, or is doing worse i have no idea why so a colleague of mine is using mac os and he says it's much better with firefox and much faster while for me fire with firefox it's completely also unusable in most cases well 
There are a lot of things I want to do, time permitting, of course. Um, the biggest one is, of course, including the bug database. I mean, there are alone a million bugs in the bug database, in the Debian bug database. Um, that would bump up the volume a lot and a lot of connections because which versions are affected. But this is something that actually would be very helpful, I mean, to represent data on the web, as we've seen before, the dashboard or something. So this is something I want to do. Then um, we have seen only really package releases as package versions that are actually contained in a release. Um, because I only parse those packages and sources in the main database that are registered in some release, in some suit. Um, it would be, it is possible to parse the, the table of the history of uploads. This is a bit more tricky because it's, well, it's not, doesn't contain the full data, but one could parse this and get the information from it so that you enrich this with intermediate releases. That would be nice. And one thing I mentioned before is to rework the dependency management, because at the moment, as I said, dependency has two type of relations as well as attributes of the relation and then pointing to the unversioned binary package. What I actually want to point is into the tree of versioned binary packages and have only one attribute of smaller or bigger or smaller or equal or something that when that you can actually search for we jump into the tree and then search for example within your suit the first version that fits you um yeah it's still possible of course but i mean it's a bit more tra trans traverse traversing the graph to find this stuff so that is something but it would be also more natural i think as a representation of dependency um, well, and after this is done, it would be nice, I mean, just to show uh, off, uh, is to rewrite the UDT dashboard I showed you before uh, and see how far the UDT dashboard based on a graph database simplifies the equivalent stuff written in on SQL code uh, curing the UDT, the relational database. And then from the theoretical side, more on the graph theoretics, what is with dependency cycles? So this is actually a project also in within Debian so that you can bootstrap off. So you don't want si dependency cycles for building because you want to somehow completely start from zero and then bootstrap yourself up. So, and, and for this finding dependency cycles would be nice. And here, here the graph database would help a lot. Connected components and, and minimal component would be other things that I love. Okay, the sources of the scripts as well as the slides, they are on the GitHub project there. So if you're interested um, or want to play around, as I said, the scripts, uh, if you uh, downloading the, the dump from the, from the UDD public server takes quite some time, please be patient. The server is not fast and dumps about one gigabyte of file onto your disk, um, but it is working. Okay, so for now, thanks for your attention, and well, maybe we have some questions or... Yeah, if you've got any, any that... questions, uh, type them in I the just... chat, or you can put them under the Neo4j users uh, online meetup chat as well. Uh, we've got a question in the Neo4j online meetup on Slack, but it's about... Uh, Graph select like tickets. Yeah, so that's not really related to the talk. Um, if you send me a message, I can. I can. Send <laughs> okay. Yes. That person. Uh, I don't think we have any questions on the on the YouTube one yet, though. Um, so is that is that repository? Is it just you who works on the project? If if people wanted to contribute, you they'd be. Uh, you'd be looking at anything, any PRs? There. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Of course. I mean, it's on 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 GitHub. Everyone can use it. It's. I mean, the scripts are not very complicated. I mean, the, the the generation of the code is, of course. I mean, the of the the nodes and relations is a bit involved yeah. because, I mean, you have to work through this database and and just work it out. Um, but yeah, it's open for everyone. It's it's open source license, so you can do whatever you want with it. I put also the slides there for those who are interested, and yeah, so. Cool. And uh, well, I, as I said, I hope that, I, so my plan is at least to include the, the bugs 
So this is the back database is something I want to put in there because then you are very close to what most of the front ends on the 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 UDT the front end dashboard or something is doing. And as soon as we have the back database in there, there's there's already everything we can recreate there. So that would be nice. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Um and I can't see any more questions, so I guess we can probably uh, we'll probably call it a call it a day. So thanks for staying up late in Japan uh, to present to yeah. us. Thanks for getting up early or for spending your lunch time. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, thanks everyone for joining, and thanks to nobody again. Okay. Bye okay. everyone. Bye.